there were a group of uh, English speaking people, and there's, there's streets named after them now, Sappingtons and Collins, and they lived out in this region. This region was called the Gravois. Kirkwood wasn't founded yet. This is 1832. Kirkwood didn't come till 1853 with the advent of the railroad being uh, surveyed to come through here. They wanted to have English mass here, and they really would like to have had it in English, you know, because everything was in Latin and the homilies were in French. So they petitioned uh, for Bishop Rosati, who was the Bishop of St. Louis at the time, um, for a priest to come out here for mass. And they sent Father Edmund Saunier from Old Cathedral. And by every Sunday, by mule, he came out. Can you imagine that? In the Old Cathedral, he came out for mass. But he's the one that started the parish and uh, uh, had the first mass here in Easter of 1832. And they ended up building this um, stone and log combination church and residence where our cemetery is today. And that was there until 1867 when uh, Father Van der Sanden was the pastor then who decided it wouldn't be good to stay out in the cemetery when everything else is being, the town is being formed where the train station is, where we is now, the town. So he bought all this strip of land from Harrison to Clay, just a long strip, and uh, built the second church, which was brick, Gothic interior inside. Uh, that church was built in 1867, and uh, it, and then the bell was put up there, uh, the St. Peter bell was put up there in 1867. Mm dedicated to St. Peter. So that's the oldest bell we've got, is our middle bell. And then in 1907, I see we have the pictures of it here, when they built this particular school right here, it's on the corner of Clay and Argonne. It was there uh, from 1907 to 1983, and it became the school uh, for the well, grade K to eight, you know, and um, uh, and then uh, 1938, 39, they built the high school. And here's Father Westhoff, and he this what this is down in the old school c cafeteria, the basement of the school. And Father Westhoff is convincing the people there in the 30s to build Coyle High School. And they built that high school. They started building it in March of 38, and they finished it in September of 38. Well, it's a depression. And so they got all these people to work. So it, it closed as a parish high school in 1960. Well, this became the primary building. And then Father Westhoff was here through most of that stuff. He built everything you see here. And, and his crowning jewel was the church, of course. And, and for, well, here's what they did. They got Joseph Murphy who was the Dean of Washington University School of Architecture. Now, Joseph Murphy also designed two other churches that were post-war modern churches. The first one was uh, St. Anne in Normandy, and it was designed by Joseph Murphy in a very modern style. We're the second, and then Resurrection Parish in South St. Louis is the third. And of the three churches that he designed in this very post-war modern American style, you might say, 1950s style, we've stood the test of time, uh, definitely the best. We needed an American way to worship in, in our own worship space, you know. And so Joseph Murphy came in and designed our church in the Basilica style, but without the Gothic arches and steeples and things like that that people were really used to. And, uh, and so it, it, it threw away the mold in a very conservative town, yeah. Kirkwood. And so when it was ultimately completed and opened in 1953, it, it had a love-hate relationship. Either you loved it and thought it was the greatest place in the spread, this, the finally that we've kind of placed it speaks to how I want to pray. And others said, this is horrendous. This is an airplane hangar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, a grocery store at the time was Bettendorf Wrap, and they said, this is a Bettendorf Wrap food store with a cross on top, you know. 
Uh, and they were just appalled by it. In a staid community like Kirkwood, we were used to this wonderful old Gothic thing that you tore down, and we were married there, our mother was buried there, and we had affection for it. And You know, you could see the scenario. One of the neat features of St. Peter Church, uh, the building itself now, uh, is that uh, you're going, you were, you're literally going to mass with the people who created it. Nothing in that church is from a catalog. Everything from that church is designed for that space by local people. Yeah. The European model was that. They didn't have a Catholic supply. Give me another St. Joseph, you know, yeah, statue. Yeah. No, they didn't have that. And so we didn't do that here. Everything is designed by the artists locally to fit into that church. Now let's talk about those windows. Emil Fry Studios still use the European way of making the windows. All the glass is from Germany. So when the molten, hot molten glass, mouth blown, they throw a, t a potato in there. When it's hot and bump, it bubbles the glass. And why do they do that? So that when the sun comes through, it reflects the, the glass like a diamond. And the color is put in at that time too. It's true stained glass, not painted on later on. They're the jewel yeah. of that structure. And, uh, but a lot of people don't understand them because they weren't the German pictorial windows. They have a picture of a, I know who that saint is, you know, yeah. and all that. Oh, that's the nativity scene. I can picture that, you know. German pictorial windows, I get it. These, a little bit more abstract. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they again were, who did, what were you on? You know, when you were building, when you're putting the, designing them uh, and all that, you know, so, and uh, now of course they've come of age, as has the building come of age, which, since the uh, remodeling of it. <laughs> and I can remember when I was here in the 80s and uh, I would bring people into St. Peter Church in the 80s before all this remodeling happened. And people say, very interesting, which meant, I'm not sure I really like it. Right. Now people say, this is really a cool church. Look at that, oh my God. That old house was just torn down a couple of years ago. Hmm. That would have been, let's see, uh, around 1950 or so. The Cardinal Ritter was only here a couple of years. He was Archbishop Ritter. He's a slight man. Look how small he was. Good grief. He didn't mess with Cardinal Ritter. He's the one that integrated the archdiocese. And the neat story, the reason why this church was built was because he came here in 1946. He began to do just spot visits to parishes, and he stopped by to see Father Westoff. And uh, uh, Father Westoff, he said, well, gee, if I, I've been here since 1928. And he thought later on, why did I tell him that? It might transfer me, you know, I like being at St. Peter. And uh, Archbishop Ritter didn't say anything. He showed him all around the complex here. The old church. They brought him over to the Martin Decor Missions, where the African American community was since the 1930s. I guess before I was actually born, mass was said out at um, Meacham Park. It was at a building that they called the Mission, and they actually started that at my grandmother's house. So they were originally saying mass there at my grandmother's house. And then Mission de Poor's, you know, came about and so forth. And then later, uh, my family came to St. Peter's.
Colonel Ritter was very Teutonic, very German, and he said, uh, Father Westhoff, I have three things to say to you. One, build a new church. There are going to be people moving out here because of the housing shortage in the city, and Kirk was going to grow. Your church is totally inadequate. And you told me before it has termites. <laughs> so uh, you need a new church here. Build a new church. Two, uh, close the Martin de Porres school as soon as it's convenient for you to do so. The African-American children should go to your school. So we're the first school to be integrated in the Archdiocese. St. Peter's School is. And the third thing he said to him, I'll talk about your transfer later. And he never transferred him. <laughs> Father Westhoff left in 1972 on his own accord, but he was here for 44 years as the pastor of St. Peter Parish. Yeah. <laughs> I actually grew up in St. Peter's. I went to school there from 1961 to 1969. We used to talk about watching Monsignor Westhoff um, walk across the parking lot. And of course, at the time, we thought he was God. There was no question about it. And it wasn't as if he was walking. It was like he floated across the parking lot. And uh, he just, there was a certain reverence about him all the time. And we were so blessed to have him part of our grade school years. He was an incredible man. He was a very holy man. And interestingly enough, after the first mass here in 1953, in April of 53, when Father Helrigo preached it here, Post-Dispatch was here to cover it because it was such a modern church and everything it got attention. They interviewed Father Westhoff about the unique features of the church. And of course, he pointed out the windows, but he also pointed out the altar. It was a freestanding altar. At that time, churches built at that time in the Catholic Church were up against the wall. And Monsignor faced the wall, the other, you know, but there was all that space between. He's up at a predella. And he told the reporter, I'm hoping that someday church law will change and I will be facing the people in English. No one even heard of Vatican II or thought of it that day, including Father Westhoff. Right. It wasn't until Pope John the 23rd, 1960 or so, said we're going to have an ecumenical council. So when, when finally altars, you, you were facing the people. All the other churches in the whole archdiocese had to make it into a makeshift church. We didn't. Yes. Father Westhoff takes the tabernacle off, puts it to the side, and we were ready in, for Mass that day. The dream was fulfilled. Few parishes have a grandfather like that, which made this parish have a, a direction and a history that, doesn't, that is not matched in most parishes, really have someone who was so rooted here for so long and affected the life of the parish for so long. Yeah. Made a big difference. Our school has changed from when you were there. There's 547 yeah. kids there now and really amazing teachers. Our charism is to form leadership and Father Westhoff did that in a very quiet and unassuming way. And you're doing it. Yeah. Well, I hope I am, yeah. <laughs> Parents, when we surveyed them and asked them, you know, why St. Peter? You know, why would you want to send your kid to St. Peter? Far and away, they say, because of faith in the community. The quality of the education is excellent, and more so, even more important than that, is I felt like my kids were really loved and just cherished, and they're, you know, they care about their soul, not just their mind. I have a son who has special needs. And then we made the decision when he was starting sixth grade to go ahead and switch over to St. Peter. And they really worked great with his needs. And uh, we had a fantastic experience with him going to middle school there. Um, and like, we're really excited about the SPICE program. That's just phenomenal to us because we were in that position where we felt like we couldn't send our special needs child to a Catholic school, which I always expected they would. The idea came from my, my, where my, one of my nieces lives, two of my nieces live in Columbus, Ohio. Their parish there started Spice, a couple started it. They had a down, high-functioning Down syndrome child after having like nine children or something, and they wanted Megan to go through St. Catherine to see on a school. And they welcomed her to St. Catherine, but they, after she got there a while, they realized the resources weren't there for her. I mean, it didn't work. 
even though they wanted to accommodate her. So these, these, this family named Ryan, uh, let's do something about that. And they began to develop the concept of SPICE, uh, Special People of Catholic Education. And so I love that concept, so we're, we brought it here. Father Jack um, uh, was really the visionary for that program. And the idea is, is to raise resources and, and implement programs that can service kids that, that have learning challenges, learning disabilities. You know, the days of saying, unless you fit in this little box, you know, then you really don't belong at a Catholic school. Well, that's over at St. Peter and, and for a long time. And, and SPICE is a big vehicle, you know, to do that. When I think of St. Peter Parish, when I see it in my mind's eye, I feel a vibrancy. It's a parish that's alive. I think of the people at play, at work on parish tasks, praying together. And I think of lively, funny, creative, engaged people really giving themselves to the, to the community. And that just isn't true of every parish. And, and what I, I think I realize is that liveliness, that vibrancy is not an accident. But also, we're a parish with leadership and innovation built into our history, with a dedication to change and to outreach and to relevance built into the history of our people and our leaders. And I think when you walk around and encounter St. Peter Parish, you feel alive. So I remember, you know, your first year here and, and the teachers telling me, well, you have to be ready for the St. Patrick's Day celebration and parade. You know, I'm having kind of a hard time envisioning, you know, all this. And, and I remember, you know, going on it and, and just sort of being you know, mouth open most of the time, just kind of in awe, like, wow, we're going to bring St. Peter Parish, you know, out in the community loud and proud. St. Patrick's Day Parade, I brought that. I did it in Washington as a joke. <laughs> Washington's so German. Yeah, right. I always say, you people have the Teutonic plate. And I said, um, we're going to have a parade. I'm going to go right outside the church in downtown Washington, and I'm going to have a parade. And it's going to go down one block. I did, and I had my Irish singing, and the guy in the in the music store played a boombox of Irish music. <laughs> no one joined me. You know, they all got out of the and looked, and all, you know, an incredulous look. He said, we're not Irish, you know, and I said, you are today. The next year, and the teachers got into the act, and we went two blocks. Third year, they decided, oh, the kids need to be in this. Then we got had to get permission from the town to walk the streets yeah, and yeah. get a route going right, and all right. that and it caught on like wildfire. It was amazing. So when I came here, we had the Mayor Svoboda come and join us at the time at Duffy's mm -hmm. and kind of get, get the idea circulating with police escort and mm -hmm. all that kind of details right. running out, which we did. People made jokes of it. They, they said, we're going to have a German float in it and we're, we're red. And they did, okay, they did it. I let them do that, <laughs> stuff like that. But there's that, they wrote that article in the Kirkwood Webster Times. Right. The whole, the whole, a whole page there. And it said a new tradition starts in St. Yeah. Peter Parish. Yeah. And it shows in color and everything. Me walking yeah. the dog, wearing my frock, my long black yeah. coat, and, yeah. a, a der, and a derby hat, and you know, all that stuff. Oh, geez, it's yeah. just amazing. And uh, we did our parade. Yeah. And that, it hasn't, we've continued to do yeah. it. Yeah. So that's how that little puppy started. I, I don't remember what the year was, but my husband and I camped, and the kids camped a lot. And we had a favorite place in Lesterville that was on the Black River. And it was very safe for kids, and it was just easy. I made a bunch of flyers and gave them to friends. And I said, just start handing them out to anybody at St. Peter's you know. Uh, the more the mirror, it'll be so much fun. And so it became this community that 
it didn't necessarily matter who your children were. If you saw a child, you just took care of them. If you were eating and a child walked up, you fed them. And um, it was it was just a very fun community effort. And then the second year, the word had gotten out about how much fun it was. I want to say we had probably 100 to 125. We had a lot of people. And some of the pictures that you saw uh, that I sent to you uh, have masks. Father Mike was there. It was just the perfect Sunday morning to do that. We're on the beach and you can still smell the sausage and egg that had been cooking over the campfire and you've got that lovely morning feeling and it was just very special. The, the alumni of St. Peter's School there is still a unity and closeness among a lot of the alumni um, that's unique in a lot of ways to, to this parish and school. And one of the biggest things that comes to mind when I think of St. Peter is St. Peter Fest. I think for anyone in the St. Louis region that is almost synonymous with St. Peter. So along comes St. Peter Fest in the first weekend of June and it's the official start of summer. You know, you see these carnival rides go up, and these, you know, beer trucks come in and games put up and, and everybody uh, comes out, you know, and says, this is the time to come home, you know, and get on the property and see old friends. And, and, and you know, the kids have this profoundly joyful, you know, it's just, you know, a lot of fun and, you know, 48 hours. You know, we loved St. Peter's Fest, and they could not wait because we would have, you know, you can buy the tickets in advance. My son wanted to make sure we had enough tickets for every ride. <laughs> yeah, and they would have, you know, later years they had all the live bands, and we would love that. Um, just, again, just meeting with the friends, and most of these people are all the ones we played sports with anyway, and we, you know, as far as their families, the kids would already be, saying where they're going to meet at, what ride they were going to be on. And you didn't even worry about any of that. They just have, they have a ball until they run out of tickets and come back for more money. You know, like Father Jack's out there, you know, the other priests who have been here, but him in particular, you know, and he's working the crowd and then they, they see it, the connection, they see the church and, you know, it brings back a lot of those positive, you know, memories and it's, you know, you see the unity of community. That's powerful. Another good memory of St. Peter's, you know. I went on the Axe Retreat in 2014, and that's when I feel like my experience of the community of St. Peter really exploded, especially women of every age and demographic really knew them on a spiritually deep level. The great thing about Axe is that it's not just a weekend and then it's over. There's so many opportunities to really become deeply involved in it, you know, by serving on the teams, but also from small groups that develop from it. Um, I have a, a group of women right now that we served in the September of 2019 team together. We're going on a field trip to Perryville this weekend <laughs> to, to be together and, and we've been studying Marian apparitions and so you know, we just, we have a bond that is really deep now. I mean, they're, they are truly sisters to me. I, I feel like people that have gone on the Axe retreats and have opened themselves to those small groups, um, they catch on fire and they want to serve mm. and they want to give back and they, they are changed, you know, they're transformed. When you have a, 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 that many people going through a common experience of prayer, that really affects the direction your parish spiritually takes. It's transforming because it's done by people from the grassroots up. You have just completed your 
time here in what I like to call the school of leadership. Why do I say that? St. Peter is the leader chosen by Jesus. His charism, his gift is to lead. You know, the charism of St. Peter is that he was a leader and Jesus recognized some leadership qualities. There was something about the character of the man that he recognizes as, as being a pastor shepherd. I expect in your school for you to become leaders in whatever school you're going to go to that you would be a leader in that school, not just sitting on the sidelines. I don't want you to sit on the sidelines in eighth grade. No, that is not your role as eighth graders from St. Peter to sit on the sidelines. You cannot do that. In fact, if you look on the outside, well, there's copper all on the outside with waves on the outside, symbolizing the water. And this is it's built like a big boat, and it's called the Bark of Peter, when they say Peter Parish, of course, and he was a fisherman. He was so privileged to come to this school as a school of leadership, named for this great saint, the only one in the Archdiocese, who Jesus chose as the leader, and we've chosen you to do the same. Amen, St. Peter? I think it's, it's the charism of people who are at St. Peter, um, and certainly should always be the pastors here, of having some sense of shepherding in a, a leadership role. We lead, we form leaders here. You tell the kids that, no, you're from St. Peter, and you're, we have the charism, and I tell teachers, we're forming leaders. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to do, because yeah. we have so many beautiful material resources and people resources. Our charism is to form leadership. Jack, thank you so much for the gift that you have been in all of our lives. You truly have taught us, loved us, inspired us every single day that we have had the joy and the gift of having you at St. Peter Parish. For us as a family, I can't tell you how much I appreciate everything that you've done for us. It was so special to celebrate all of our boys' sacraments with you. Congratulations, Congratulations. We have so many good memories with you. Two trips to Rome where we were together. Four kids to Chicago, one of which I was with you. That was so much fun. Acts, countless breaking bread together. I want to thank you for the opportunity you've given me to work at St. Peter Parish. Monsignor Jack. We just are always indebted to your kindness, generosity, and the big vision picture you have for St. Peter. We just appreciate your, um, your guidance and your love and your passion for the church and, and the community and the liturgy. Your homilies are just so inspiring and so um, wonderful to listen to. I look forward to hearing you speak every time. Hey, Father Jack. One thing I think about um, that I will miss is your, are your homilies and the way you speak and open up and really challenge us as parishioners to, to wake up. You've been a great pastor. Not only have you kept our beautiful church still beautiful, you've kept all of us. You've done everything for us to keep us happy. And I thank you for that. I've heard it twice. I could hear it without even knowing the people or the kids that are graduating. The you don't fit or you don't fit here anymore um, always makes me cry. It's an unbelievable, poignant um, graduation uh, message. The day that my father passed away, it was such a sad and somber moment 
But Father Jack walked in and he said, this is what we're gonna do. Everybody's gonna take a moment and recite one fond memory that you have of Charlie. And he just made it more of a joyous occasion, which is what home going is supposed to be. You know, there's a word I'd use to describe uh, Jack Costello, and that, that word is passion. That's why his homilies at funerals are so extraordinary, because he cares about how people lived, what jokes they told, uh, what they loved. Uh, and he wants to embrace that. He wants to imagine it. And he wants to share that out with people. And he feels the passion to do that deep in his bones. I think that's probably one of his greatest similarities to Christ, is that personal interest in you, yourself, your story, your highs, your lows, just totally you. It's very powerful. I think he really understands that he is a piece of a legacy here at St. Peter Parish. He does not want St. Peter Parish defined around him. You hear him talk often very um, almost lovingly about the pastors before him that have sacrificed you know for this parish and, and its people. And you have made St. Peter amazing so thank you for everything you've done for St. Peter. So we love you, we'll miss you. It's so hard to say goodbye, but I know we will see you in Kirkwood Town. We love you, we love your silly, we love your serious, and we're, we have an open door policy here. So please come back to Argonne Drive and we'll have dinner for you. We are forever grateful for your being present to us and just pouring yourself out to us, our little family, and really to our whole parish family. Some people come into our lives, leave footprints in our hearts, and we are never the same. You've been so good to our family, and of course you've been so good to the St. Peter's family. You are simply the best. We will miss you. Love you, Father Jack. Love you so much.